I'd like to introduce everyone to Science Gallery Bengaluru, which is a new institution for public engagement with research and Contagion, which is our fourth exhibition and first fully digital uh, exhibition season. Um, Contagion is now in phase two and will be closing on December 31st. So we're in our final two weeks of programming and we're really excited to have with us Amelia Bunia today, who will be speaking about communicating Contagion infectious media and technologies 1870 to 1914. Uh, before we get uh, into Amelia's lecture, I'd also like to uh, tell you a bit about the programs for this weekend. So that tomorrow we have a lecture by uh, natural history writer Pranel Lal on the natural history of viruses. So this is his new book, which is out and it will be a really exciting lecture. So that's tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. And uh, if you also have a chance, do watch Contagion Cabaret, an amazing performance musical about the history of pandemics. And this will be followed up by a live discussion with the actors, the director, and the academics next weekend. So uh, don't forget to sign up for all that. The links are in the chat. Uh, now to introduce Amelia. Amelia is a historian of, med of media, science, technology, and medicine, working primarily on modern and contemporary South Asia and Britain. Her first monograph, The News of Empire, Telegraphy, Journalism, and the Politics of Reporting in Colonial India, 1830 to 1900, was awarded the 2017 Eugenia M. Palmigiano Prize for the best book on the history of journalism by the American Historical Association. Currently, she is based at the University of Heidelberg, she, and she is the primary investigator on a project about the history of paleosciences in 20th century India, funded by the German Research Foundation. I have some interesting questions about that already. So I'd like to remind the audience to, uh, that uh, this will be an interactive session. So at the end of Amelia's lecture, she will be taking questions. So please do type your questions in the Q&A box. And please don't forget to fill out our feedback form, which is really important. It will help us to do things better and know what more you'd like to see from us. Now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Amelia uh, to talk today. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, thank you very much, Madhu. Let me just try to share the screen first. Everything goes okay. Can you see it? Is yes, thing? we can, yeah. we okay, can see us. Yeah. So thank you very much for this generous introduction. And uh, before I begin, I would also like to thank John V, uh, Gayatri, and all the other members of the team for inviting me to present uh, my work here today. Um, it's really a great honor to give a talk as part of uh, Science Gallery Bangalore's uh, ongoing, and um, I have to say, unfortunately, very timely uh, exhibition on Contagion, uh, along with so many other um, aspiring scholars and uh, artists. Um, and hello also to many of my friends and colleagues who I've seen among the participants. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, the whole set of exhibits is impressive, but um, I have to admit that I was slightly biased towards um, the one on uh, the Bombay Plague of 1896, 1897. Uh, and this is because although I'm going to speak uh, mostly about Victorian and uh, Edwardian Britain today, I am uh, actually a historian of modern and contemporary South Asia and the British Empire by training. Uh, and I wrote about the uh, Bombay plague in my first uh, monograph on uh, journalism and technologies of communication uh, in colonial India, as uh, you have just heard, which you can see in this uh, uh, next slide. Uh, looking in particular at uh, the press coverage around it and uh, how the electric telegraph, um, a technology that was introduced uh, in India in the mid 19th century, was used to transmit uh, news about the plague. So broadly speaking, uh, my work has been situated at the intersections of media, uh, science, technology, and uh, medicine, which I've tried to study through a combination of global and micro history approaches. Um, so to put differently, I'm always concerned about finding the right balance between history on a big scale and the myriad little stories uh, that go into its making. And uh, one significant chunk of my research to date has focused on the history of communication technologies, in particular, the electric telegraph and the telephone. And there are two main strands of investigation that I have pursued in this regard. Uh, 
Uh, firstly, I try to understand how the electric telegraph, which was often hailed um, and rather misleadingly so uh, as the internet of the 19th century, uh, was incorporated into journalism, especially into practices of news reporting in colonial South Asia. And secondly, um, I explore from both historical and contemporary perspectives the interfaces between technologies of communication and health. Uh, for example, I have looked at the electric telegraph and the telephone in Victorian and Edwardian Britain, uh, but also, as you can see in this slide, at mobile phones and telecom towers in contemporary India to understand how anxieties about physical and mental well-being were associated with new technologies of communication. In the case of Britain, I've also investigated how the electric telegraph and the telephone were used in medical practice and public health in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So in other words, the idea was to gain a long-term perspective on the ways in which uh, communication technologies have intersected with the fields of uh, medicine and public health, and thus contribute a biomedical dimension to historical and cultural studies of communication technologies, which have tended to focus primarily on the, uh, their incorporation into uh, military activities, uh, diplomacy, finance, uh, transport, or literature. And uh, the other thing I would like to emphasize is that uh, I ended up studying the history of communication technologies in Victorian and Edwardian Britain via my interest in colonial South Asia, not the other way around. Um, and this means that when I started off, and in fact, I think I can safely say that even nowadays, um, I was much more acquainted with the history of telecommunications in South Asia than in Britain. Uh, I was very familiar, for example, with the narratives of progress, civilization, and improvement that surrounded the introduction of these technologies in colonial South Asia. Uh, but because most of the materials I had worked with were colonial records, uh, in which Britain invariably featured as the metropolitan model to be emulated, I wasn't initially aware of the extent to which new technologies of communication had generated debates and anxieties in Britain itself. And the fact that many of these anxieties were framed in national and imperial terms. So they stemmed out of competitions with other, uh, usually Western uh, nations and imperial powers, most prominently Germany, uh, France, and the US. Uh, thus, while Britain had no qualms about exhibiting its superiority in relation to its colonies, um, this confidence often dissipated when it dealt with other countries like Germany, France, or the US. Uh, and the telephone is a particularly interesting and relevant example here. If we consider that in uh, 1911, uh, there were about uh, 11 million telephones in use worldwide, of which more than 67% were in the US, about 9.5% in Germany, and only 5.75% in the UK. Uh, now, one of the reasons why uh, the UK was slow to use uh, the telephone was because it regarded it as a competitor to the extant telegraph network. Um, the logic being, why bother to invest uh, in a new technology when you already have one that is functioning reasonably well? Uh, but rather ironically, uh, some American commentators uh, interpreted this state of affairs as clear proof of, I quote, how slow Englishmen are in accepting improvements of the greatest and most evident value, end of quote. Uh, so all this research was conducted at the University of Oxford when I was working there as a postdoctoral researcher as part of two uh, distinct projects. One was called the Challenge of Urbanization, Health in the Global City, uh, which was funded by the Wellcome Trust and the John Fell Fund. And uh, the other was called the uh, Diseases of Modern Life, you can see in this uh, slide, uh, funded by the European Research uh, Council. And the Contagion Cabaret, which you're going to see here later, was actually one of the outcomes of this uh, project. Uh, and today I'm going to speak about the work I did as part of the uh, Diseases of Modern Life project, uh, some of which was published uh, in the monograph, you can see uh, in this slide, uh, co-authored with my uh, former colleagues, uh, and in a paper which has just come out uh, in Technology and Culture. And my talk will proceed in two uh, parts. Uh, first, I will try to sketch a broader picture of the ways in which the use of telephony intersected with medical practice and public health in the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, including the management of infectious diseases, and then discuss some of the health anxieties associated with its use, with a focus on fears that telephones could act as fomites in the transmission of infectious diseases. Um, the late 19th century, the period to which most of my talk pertains, uh, represented the dawn of what uh, American physician and historian of medicine, George Rosen, uh, has fittingly called the bacteriological era, 
a time when the epidemiology and prevention of infectious diseases began to be firmly grounded in the investigative methods of laboratory science. And this approach complemented the improvements in sanitation ushered in by the introduction of sanitary statistics during the earlier decades of the 19th century. Um, in this context, uh, public health crises like the third plague pandemic that originated in China in the 1850s and became particularly virulent by the end of the century, uh, spreading to South Asia and pretty much all other parts of the world, um, it's a particularly interesting example to study because it was, as one author put it, the first major disease crisis of this new bacteriological era. So this means that laboratory investigations, hospitalization, segregation, masking and vaccination were central to the process of understanding the etiology of the disease, uh, devising ways to contain it and finding a cure for those afflicted. And this is a, a simplified account, but it does capture the medical background. Uh, we are dealing with for that period. And to this medical background, I would like to add a media angle as well, to which I'll keep returning throughout my talk, uh, and say that the newspaper and periodical press of the time uh, played an important role in producing and publicizing this new bacteriological science and the medical technologies associated with it, um, enabling members of the medical community to communicate with each other and the broader public, uh, but also exposing conflicts of authority, as well as the racial and social hierarchies that plagued public health, uh, especially in colonial contexts like those of India, uh, but as I've already hinted, in Britain itself. Now, as I'm sure you, you know, technologies of transport and communication have been central to the making and management of epidemic uh, uh, diseases, at least since the 19th century. And when I say making, I refer in particular to the role that steamers, railways, and more recently airplanes have played in integrating the world into ever-expanding networks of transport and communication, uh, thus facilitating the global circulation of people, goods, and ideas, but also pathogens. And again, the plague pandemic was a particularly good example in this regard, uh, revealing the crucial role that global networks of communication played in the spread of disease worldwide. Uh, as historian Mark Harrison reminds us, the fact that the plague broke out in Hong Kong in 1894 proved to be particularly significant since this port city was sitting at the hub of an Asian Pacific trading network and became the point from which plague was disseminated around the world, turning a serious, pandemic, uh, a serious epidemic into a pandemic of horrific proportions. But in the context of my talk, uh, it's important to remember that 19th and 20th century encounters with technological modernity were not limited to such technology-mediated interhuman and interspecies interactions that amplified the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, there was a much wider and richer repertoires of interactions between communication technologies, medicine, and health, um, a repertoire which I will try to sketch in one fall, in what follows. Um, and one dimension that is nowadays largely forgotten uh, by both uh, humanity scholars and the general public is the fact that medicine and public health have always been among the first spheres of activity to engage with and incorporate new technologies of communication. This was true of the telegraph and the telephone in the 19th century, both of which were employed in medical practice and teaching uh, to monitor epidemic outbreaks and coordinate public health responses, as it was of the wireless pages used by hospitals in New York and London in the 1950s. And in fact, it's possible to think about the use of the telephone, uh, of the telegraph first and the telephone in medicine uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries as anticipating contemporary telecare and telehealth programs. Uh, in which digital technology plays an important role in the management of medical institutions and in delivering health-related services. So I would like to dwell a bit on this aspect before going on to speak about telephones and infectious diseases in the second part of my talk, because I think this story illustrates well the complex ways in which people incorporated these technologies into their lives in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Much like today, there was a fair amount of anxiety about the stresses of modern life among 19th and early 20th century commentators, many of which were associated with new technologies uh, of communication. But we should not forget that these concerns were balanced by a considerable degree of enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm about this new world of opportunities in which technology played a central role, both in an engine and a product of modernity. So if for some observers, 19th century modernity proved disruptive and oppressive, 
For others, it offered opportunities for improvement, uh, experimentation, and creativity in various domains of social life. And besides, this was an age in which Western science and technology were regarded as the epitome of progress and civilization. As sociologist John Tomlinson has argued in his study of modernity and speed, this ideology of progress, which has underpinned technological innovation over the last two centuries, has always forced a choice for the modern upon us, especially in those cases when technologies were supposed to, or were designed to economize both time and labor. So in other words, it became very difficult and it's still very difficult to reject such technology without appearing irrational or obtuse. And we can get a glimpse of this uh, complex social life of technology by looking at the telephone system organized in Budapest in 1893, which anticipated the radio by allowing subscribers to access live entertainment and news, but was also used in hospitals and in doctors waiting room. So um, this was a version, uh, if you wish, a, version, a vision of the telephone as an instrument of healing, not only of communication. Right? Uh, for the journalist Arthur Mee, who saw in this latest technological innovation the fulfillment of uh, uh, Edward Bellamy's utopian prophecy that in future people would listen to sermons and music room performances in their own homes, the pleasure telephone, as it was called in Britain, was no less than an instrument that democratized the social luxuries of the rich. At one penny a day or 30 shilling per year, the pleasure telephone was cheap compared to its ordinary counterpart and had uh, in Hungary alone 6,000 subscribers. Uh, a similar system uh, also existed in Paris, where it was known uh, as the theater phone, as you can see in this poster by Jules Cheret. Now, reading the medical press of the 19th century, one is struck by the degree of interest in modern means of communication, as demonstrated, for example, by numerous uh, attempts to adapt technology to the specific requirements and circumstances of medical practice. Um, in the last three decades of the 19th century, some British and American doctors conducted experiments to establish whether the telephone could be used as an aid to medical diagnosis, for example, to hear cardiac murmurs, uh, different varieties of respiration and to sound for bladder stones. Uh, one doctor from the University College Hospital explained that the microphone and the telephone had the potential to assist in the identification of smaller calculi, which if left behind could lead to the formation of larger stones. So these are bladder stones, right? Um, nevertheless, other doctors concluded that these calculi were not of the type that could not have been identified by an unassisted ear and hand, not to mention that microphones, which were used in this way, uh, often amplified the sound too much and reproduced other noises. So it was not always uh, easy for doctors to distinguish between the various sources of sound. Arguably more important that this type of applications, uh, which were usually attended with a mixed degree of success, was the fact that by the end of the 19th century, uh, the telephone was becoming indispensable to the functioning of a modern hospital with reports of medical institutions often containing references to their communication arrangements. And we, what you can see in this slide is an example from the uh, early 20th century, the convalescent home at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, uh, parts of which were designated by King Edward VII to be used for the recuperation of military and Navy officers. Um, but this is a late example. Uh, the topic was already preoccupying medical writers in the 1880s, when, for example, the medical press and circular uh, conducted a campaign for the introduction of telephones into Dublin hospitals. And it's interesting because those members of the profession who insisted that the use of the telephone was incompatible with medical practice, for example, because the ringing disturbed uh, consultations or because it interfered with uh, resting time of medical staff, uh, so these members of the profession were dismissed by the editor of the uh, journal as being of the, I quote, antique and musty type and of the take it easy class. Um, the telephone also proved particularly useful in coordinating medical response to emergencies and in the management of infectious diseases. Uh, the image you can see in this slide was part of a plan by a gentleman named Benjamin Howard, uh, who made a proposal for the establishment of an ambulance system in London in 1882. This was to follow the American model of creating telegraphic and telephonic rings around hospitals um, in order to facilitate communication between the police who was responsible for announcing emergencies uh, and medical authorities. 
by the end of the century, uh, hospitals that made use of horse ambulances, such as Charing Cross uh, University College in Westminster, uh, benefited from telephonic communication and were able to provide timely assistance when summoned by the police. And they had similar systems in other cities like uh, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, and Leeds. So apart from helping to coordinate the transport of patients in cases of medical emergencies, uh, the use of telegraphy and telephony was also important because it minimized the risk of infection, uh, enabling public health authorities to communicate with each other while avoiding direct physical contact with infected persons. And this was especially the case in accounts of the ambulance system operated by the Metropolitan Asylums Board, an institution that dealt with London's sick and poor, uh, which used the telephone to coordinate the removal to hospitals uh, of persons suffering from fever or smallpox. And one question that vexed public health authorities, um, as one of the managers of the asylums board pointed out, was that no matter how perfect the ambulance and hospital arrangements were, there was always a serious risk that infection would be spread indirectly by the friends of patients who visited them. The uh, historian Graham Mooney has pointed out that the dangers of cross infection in isolation hospitals were a major concern for Victorian authorities. And this problem was often resolved architecturally by isolating patients in separate worlds. In such cases, the telephone was often used to communicate between various parts of the hospital, but also to enable patients to speak to their relatives outside of the hospital. And this is interesting because the emotional costs of isolating infectious patients from their families was a topic of discussion that also cropped up in India, uh, for example, during the plague uh, outbreak in Bombay. But in the British case, um, Anthony Roche, a professor of hygiene at the Catholic University Medical School in Dublin, uh, used his experiments of the smallpox epidemic in Dublin to argue that the poor had objected to their removal from their houses, not because they feared going to the hospital, but because once there, they could not see or hear of their friends. So it was for this reason that Roche proposed that such hospitals be connected by telephone with one or more central stations for the benefit of patients and their families. So the point I've been trying to make by highlighting uh, these other ways in which communication technologies were used in medical practice and public health is that the social impact of these technologies in the 19th and early 20th centuries should not be understood exclusively within the framework of an anxious modernity um, that only generated fear and skepticism about these new technologies. Um, I haven't managed to discuss all the medical applications of the telephone, uh, but it should be clear from this brief account that uh, in some cases, the telephone helped to bridge, bridge physical distance, for example, by playing an important role in the management uh, of emergencies and infectious diseases. Uh, helping people with uh, hearing disabilities or placing patients in timely communication with their doctors. In other cases, however, the opposite was true. Uh, that is, the telephone became an instrument for creating distance. For example, when it was used to listen to a lady's chest from a dis distance. And uh, in this case, telephonic auscultation was welcomed as an efficient way of overcoming what they called the modest reserve of patients. And in yet other cases, it emerged as a device that was essential to the proper functioning of a modern hospital, a powerful symbol of modernity and a tool by which doctors and medical institutions were evaluated. So let me now discuss telephones and infection from a perspective that does intersect with um, the framework of a nervous modernity to which I have uh, previously alluded. Um, although even in this case, I'm hoping to show that we should not limit ourselves to this interpretation alone. Um, apart from facilitating the actual spread of infectious diseases, um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, transport and communication technologies also became associated with a bewildering range of catching or contagious fears, panics, and other nervous pathologies, among them intriguing conditions such as railway spine, telegraphy cramp, and telephone ear. For example, railway spine was a term um, often used to refer to a host of physical and mental symptoms that many passengers experienced after railway accidents. Uh, in today's uh, uh, vocabulary, a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder. And telegraphy cramp refers to what today we would call repetitive strain injuries, such as tendonitis and uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, usually associated with the use of computers uh, and mobile phones. 
Uh, but back in the 19th century, um, it was caused by writing or the strain of operating the telegraph key. Uh, such conditions have often been interpreted as neurosis of modernity, um, an umbrella term that designated a broad range of nervous pathologies associated with the stresses of modern life. So for example, it was common to talk about professional neurosis or craft neurosis in the 19th century. And uh, many contemporary accounts underscore the element of mental contagion in this affliction. So Victorian commentators believed that people of a nervous disposition, and often women, for example, were particularly susceptible to catching technological illnesses, uh, their frayed nerves strained to breaking point by the stresses of modern life. Um, and needless to say, the media played an important role in spreading this kind of mental contagion. Uh, as I've already mentioned, in Victorian and Edwardian Britain, newspapers and periodicals were central to the circulation of scientific knowledge claims, um, including claims about the etiology and treatment of infectious diseases. Um, the press often acted as a watchdog of the government during public health crisis, um, mediating the transnational exchange of knowledge and offering a plot platform for the making and popularization of science. At the same time, however, um, technologies of communication were also central to the circulation of infectious misinformation, um, especially since the advent of the electric telegraph in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, if prior to the arrival of the telegraph, information moved physically through space along with its material carriers, uh, the new technology anticipated the internet by making possible a dematerialized mobility uh, in which intelligence traveled faster and further as electric signals along an increasingly global network of cables. And this transformed technological scenario enhanced the media's ability to function as a platform for the dissemination of scientific knowledge, uh, debating solutions to epidemic outbreaks and epistemic crisis, uh, but also spreading misinformation, uncertainty, and panic. Now, a good example of how these factors converged uh, were public concerns about infection by telephone which became conspicuous in the British and uh, British medical and popular press from around the 1880s until the outbreak of World War I. Um, although, as you can see in this slide, similar reports also circulated in countries like the US, Germany, France, and even India. Um, this, what is interesting is that this period coincided with the introduction and expansion of the telephone network in Britain, a time when uh, people were gradually getting used to this new technology um, not unlike our own experiences with the internet over the past uh, decades. And equally importantly, this was also time of rampant tuberculosis and regular epidemic outbreaks of influenza, smallpox, or diphtheria. Uh, we should also remember that although Robert Koch discovered the tubercular bacillus in uh, 1882, this did not immediately translate into a cure for tuberculosis, which remained a public health problem of enormous significance. So it was, in fact, the number one killer in industrialized countries at that time. So the introduction of the telephone in Britain and the gradual expansion of the network overlapped with a growing acceptance of germ theory by the public at a time when tuberculosis featured prominently in public health campaigns. It's palliative care and prevention, including hygiene practices like prohibiting public spitting, disinfection, and ventilation, played an important role in attempts to tackle this public health threat. Uh, furthermore, even after the identification of the bacillus, the actual mechanisms of transmission of tuberculosis remained unclear, which means that new and old ideas about germs, fomites, dust, and even heredity and alcoholism were often combined to explain the spread of infection. And all these factors help explain why it was tuberculosis and not influenza, which played a key role in how the public imagined uh, health risks posed by telephone. It was not so much the mass character of the technology. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, telephone use was rather limited in Britain at the time, but the importance of tuberculosis as a serious public health threat uh, that made the topic of tuberculous telephones, as they were sometimes called in the press, uh, particularly relevant. So in this context, some people started to fear that telephones, um, especially public telephones, I mean, there were not, at, during that period, there were not many private telephones to begin with. Uh, but so uh, both the instruments, uh, which changed many hands and were held closely to the face and mouse, as well as uh, the closed call offices, which were poorly ventilated, uh, 
uh, could spread infectious diseases, for example, by acting as fomites uh, when they became contaminated with different pathogens, or by trapping tubercular dust, which was then inhaled. Uh, much like spitting in public uh, spaces, unventilated dusty silence cabinets uh, and public hall offices, usually installed by telephone companies in railway stations, uh, shops, hotels, and business exchanges, and later known as telephone kiosks, threatened to pass on a disease that was already difficult, uh, uh, notoriously difficult to contain. And the same was true of telephone mouse species that harbored uh, what they called the dangerous bodily slippage, usually in the form of sputum, and came into close contact with the speaker's face. So these concerns were then highlighted in the press, uh, eventually prompting medical authorities, uh, post office officials, and telephone companies in Britain to launch a string of investigations into the possibility of contracting tuberculosis, diphtheria, and other infectious diseases through the use of telephones. Now, these uh, anxieties about uh, infectious and especially tuberculous telephones uh, can be conceptualized as neurosis of modernity, uh, insofar as fears of infection were fueled by technological novelty, uh, and these fears were themselves contagious, uh, becoming more dangerous than the actual telephones. And indeed, some commentators um, attempted to downplay uh, concerns about infectious telephones as sensationalists a diagnosis that underscored the role of the media in creating and fomenting this public health scare. Uh, the British Post Office, which had a monopoly over the telephone system in Britain and then licensed various telephone companies to provide services to subscribers, was um, particularly invested in this line of argumentation. For example, Postmaster General uh, Buxton dismissed the claims about infectious uh, telephones as scare, uh, and pointed out that these conclusions were based on the fallacious assumption that, I quote, pulmonary tuberculosis must inevitably develop on the inhalation of anti-living tubercular bacilli, no matter what degree of virulence this bacilli possessed or in what numbers they were present. Rather than being uh, injurious to health, Buxton concluded sarcastically, the telephones were trying to the temper. Uh, so this episode suggests that um, investigating public health concerns associated with the use of telephones provides insights not only into the imaginations of fearful, occasionally technoskeptic modern mind, but also into the history of telecommunications in Britain, uh, the complex processes which led to the creation of scientific knowledge about tuberculosis, as well as the role of media therein. Uh, indeed, uh, occasional reports about the role of telephones in spreading diseases such as influenza, diphtheria, and tuberculosis, which began to appear in the newspaper and periodical press in the late 1880s, helped to bring this topic into the public eye and eventually stirred postal authorities into action, not least because the publication of alarmist reports was calculated to do substantial harm to the call office business, as some of the post office uh, officials pointed out. So, for example, representations in the newspaper press uh, prompted uh, medical officer of health for the city, the medical officer of health for the city of London, uh, to request that bacteriological tests be conducted on the mouse species of transmitters uh, in public hall offices in 1905. Um, these tests were conducted by a doctor, uh, Bridget Klein, at the Saint Bartholomew's Hospital. It's one of the oldest hospitals in the city of London. And um, the procedure involved washing 12 telephone mouse pieces in sterile distilled water using a brush. And this, the resulting solution was that injected uh, in equal parts in uh, guinea pigs. But the post-mortem examination found no traces of tubercular bacilli in uh, these animals. And so the outcome of these investigations were then communicated to the public via uh, post office press communique which concluded that, I quote, uh, the use of so valuable a means of communication like the telephone is without any attendant danger. And the only precaution advisable is the obvious common sense one of keeping the mouse species clean, by which they usually mean disinfecting the telephone. Um, a few years later, the story repeats itself. Uh, reports published in the prestigious medical, medical journal, The Lancet, led to an inquiry in the parliament. Uh, which eventually prompted postal authorities to commission new bacteriological tests in 1910. This time, uh, the instruments came from various public places and included one allegedly used by a consumptive person, so a person suffering from tuberculosis. Uh, 
the procedure was similar and the new tests uh, reinforced earlier conclusions, uh, establishing beyond doubt that the mouse species examined were free from uh, tubercular and diphtheria bacilli. Uh, however, the report received mixed reactions. Uh, some doctors doubted the re reliability of the investigation method, arguing that time drastically reduced the chances of identifying pathogens on the instruments. Uh, whereas others believed that a considerable time lapse between the use of the mouse species and their subsequent examination favored positive results as the bacteria propagate, propagated in dust and dirt. Uh, for his part, the doctor who conducted these tests was eager to continue his investigation on instruments used solely by physical patients, so patients who suffered from tuberculosis, because he argued that with public telephones, uh, there was simply no guarantee that they had been used by persons suffering from tuberculosis. So the new tests were uh, conducted at the Brompton Hospital Sanatorium and Convalescent Home in Frimley in the southwest of London uh, on patients in an advanced stage of tuberculosis because they produced more sputum. And you can see here a drawing of a TB patient who was made to speak uh, into the telephone. Uh, this is from the uh, British Telecom uh, uh, archives, um, after which the instrument was washed with sterile water and the washings was, were again injected into guinea pigs. As before, the final report concluded that the transmission of tuberculosis through the medium of the telephone mouse piece was practically impossible. And the results were again communicated to the press with specific instructions that the reports should reach uh, the Lancet and the British Medical Journal. Um, these press reports uh, emphasized that the re uh, results were supported by the American government's uh, independent inquiry so a similar story was being played out in the US in the meantime, uh, as to the condition of public telephones uh, in the United States, uh, while another uh, article broke the news as a fallacy again exploded. Um, at the public's request, this article was republished uh, five years later um, under a headline proclaiming that telephones were sanitary, uh, all of them. This being said, uh, interest in telephones and infection did not disappear over the following decades. Um, apart from occasional reports in the press, uh, some of them republications of uh, older articles, uh, the topic still featured on the post office's agenda and uh, in further medical investigations into the possibility of contracting disease uh, via telephones. Uh, so, for example, in a test conducted in 1937 at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, uh, focused primarily on contamination with bacteria like Streptococcus salivarus, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and Staphylococcus albus. Um, and although the cultures were prepared uh, in a similar manner to the tests that I have uh, discussed uh, by taking swabs from the mouse pieces of public telephones in Edinburgh, an important difference was that they reflected changes in technology uh, and distinguished between hand telephones and telephones with uh, uh, separate receiver and transmitter. Uh, the tests concluded that the former had a noticeably higher bacteriological content on account of their position relative to the mass of the speaker, and that contamination with Staphylococcus aureus was indeed possible, uh, if somehow remote. Uh, thus, uh, although concerns about uh, infection by telephone resurfaced from time to time, uh, the post-World War II period witnessed a noticeable shift away from diseases like tuberculosis and diphtheria, likely because their burden on public health also decreased with the advent of chemotherapy treatments and mass vaccination campaigns. So to conclude, um, what lessons can we learn from such historical examples that might benefit uh, uh, our contemporary predicament uh, and perhaps also our public health communication practices? Um, for one, uh, it might be might be reassuring to think that many of the anxieties that we find ourselves experiencing firsthand uh, also beset our predecessors. Uh, we are clearly not the first ones to reach for the disinfectant uh, to clean our now um, mobile phones and electronic gadgets, uh, even if the latest research uh, suggests that the risk of uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission by such fomites um, is uh, uh, low. Um, but beyond such um, reassurances, um, what the uh, current uh, pandemic has also demonstrated is that commentary on public uh, health, originating both with the specialist and non-specialist public, um, is, as uh, Victoria Berridge and Kelly Laughlin have reminded us, rarely history-free. And this is somehow ironic, 
considering that in many countries, uh, past epidemics have been almost completely erased uh, from public memory. Uh, but I think it also points to the role that historians and medical humanities researchers more generally uh, can and should play, not only in helping to restore uh, the memory of such events, uh, but also helping to eliminate how certain theories of disease transmission and public health measures came into being uh, in the first place. And perhaps the best example of this is the debate uh, about the airborne nature of COVID-19 and the difference between droplets and aerosols, which has had significant implications for public health policies. Uh, the cutoff size of five microns has been accepted as a given in the medical community for decades, uh, although it took the interdisciplinary work of scientists and historians uh, to figure out how it came into being uh, in the first place and indeed to question the usefulness of that distinction. So what this suggests is that uh, familiarity with the history of research on respiratory disease this transmission uh, can have an impact on contemporary public health policies and the way in which they are communicated to the public. And interestingly, the research on COVID-19 has also revealed that tuberculosis has remained, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the reference standard for airborne infection. Um, the experiments I've discussed uh, here should be viewed as part of a, a longer ongoing attempt to illuminate the actual mechanisms of transmission of TB uh, and other respiratory diseases. Uh, and finally, as a medical and social phenomena, epidemics tend to be highly mediatized events. And this is both a good and a bad thing. Uh, in the example I discussed, the press played an important role in articulating, uh, but also creating and amplifying concerns about the role of telephones in spreading infectious diseases. Uh, then, like now, uh, the media represented an important source of information on scientific issues. And in fact, um, the scientists themselves were important science communicators. Uh, the press brought a potential public health issue to the attention of the authorities and pressured them to spring into action. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, it also peddled sensationalism and stereotypes which fomented fear uh, to the point that fear became almost as contagious as disease itself. And the other problem is that scientific uncertainty was communicated across press reports that contradicted each other rather than within the same piece of news. And so into this gap of scientific, but also bureaucratic uncertainty, uh, enterprising individuals found an opportunity for financial gain uh, by designing and marketing a bewildering array of disinfecting products uh, that were advertised with the help of the popular and medical press uh, for whom advertising represented the main source of avenue, uh, of uh, revenue, sorry, uh, and which sat a bit awkwardly uh, alongside uh, reports like we have seen earlier, that telephones were safe, uh, all of them. And with this, I've come to the end of my uh, talk. And I would like to thank you very much for listening to me for such a long time. Um, Shall I stop for uh, slide sharing? Or? Yes, thank you, Amelia. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. And I, before we um, get started, I'd like to encourage the audience to uh, drop any questions they might have into the Q&A box and we will share the questions with Amelia um, right now and await her answer. So if you'd like, if you have any questions from the talk, please do share them with us. Um, that was a really, really interesting uh, lecture, Amelia. And I think my main <laughs> feeling was however much things change they do stay the same somehow you yeah. you could we could see so many um parallels with uh, uh the things that have happened or the things we've experienced during this pandemic um especially around the sort of new avatar of the telephone i mean now the mobile phone in itself has become sort of a crucial player in the pandemic in both like as you spoke about in being part of medicine and you know in treatment but also in terms of uh, communication and how we de dealt with information so was there anything in particular uh, while of course during this period that particularly struck you as you know or maybe made you want to go back and look at your research most closely by what you by what we sort of experienced during this pandemic and whether it made you ask uh, new questions of the research that you had already done about the about the telephone's role in uh, during the plague. Um, 
Uh, thank you so much for this question. It, it, it's a very good question. And I, I think, I mean, I'm working now, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning, on a project that is completely different. <laughs> it looks at the global entanglements of uh, Indian paleo sciences, so basically paleontology so, and paleo botany. So I didn't have time to go back you know, to this research. I was happy, in fact, that it came out uh now because the research was conducted well before the pandemic struck mm. but for me the the most fascinating is exactly what you mentioned uh in, in the first part of your question this is the most fascinating part how um, do we find the right so how do we strike the right balance between saying that you know a lot of things haven't changed and uh, uh you know paying attention to the things that have changed because in fact you know uh, we are concerned uh, and perhaps our you know anxieties and fears are similar to the ones of uh, our 19th century predecessors but actually the technologies we are working with are not you know the socioeconomic and political context is not the same right the diseases it's uh, themselves are not the same right i mean we can see this clearly with this virus how it keeps changing and fading right so i think we should not lose track what well, that's why i said it might be comforting to a certain extent to think about these parallels and to think that you know people be, before us have experienced this kind of anxieties but i think we should also be aware of uh, uh, the fact that a lot of things are actually different so we do know many more things now about uh, the mechanisms of transmission of infectious diseases and also as i was uh, mentioning throughout my talk the comparison between the telegraph and the internet is rather misleading right i mean it is uh, yeah it it allows for dematerialized communication, but uh, you know, uh, have operating the telegraph in the 19th century is not the same thing like us nowadays with the internet sitting, you know, in the privacy of our homes or going to the telegraph office and sending a telegram. So, and also the questions of access: how many people can actually access these technologies nowadays? And although there are still the, the, the digital cap is still there, but it's not like it was in the 19th century. So, these kind of differences uh, and you know, nuances are also important to keep in mind. I feel rather than, you know, making this kind of sweeping generalization. Yeah, yeah. other people no. also experience this. No, absolutely. And I think also something else that came out was sort of the sources that were accessible through this, like because you spoke a lot about The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, and, you know, the sort of sources who were putting out information. And now, of course, we have a much uh, broader and less, um, in a sense, sources over which there isn't much oversight through which information comes into the public domain so i think that's very interesting i was also wondering like you spoke uh maybe a sort of what was the you know the public response of course was one sort of uh portion of it like the anxiety and uh with which the public sort of uh, you know, came to face to face with the telephone during the during looking during PB and so on. But what was sort of the official sort of government uh, or like you know the uh, what was that stand? Because was that uh, were they also sort of very cognizant of people's fears and then taking that into control and you know having policies based on that, or were they more focused on sort of the findings that came out? What what was sort of your sense uh, from that time? This is a very good question, and that's why I'm always insisting that we shouldn't think about these diseases or we shouldn't frame them only in terms of, you know, an anxious modernity, because if you look at it deeply, there's always politics involved in it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and when the state comes in, uh, the, the position that the state takes influences a lot, you know, the uh, public's trust in the institutions of right and in, in science, and that's, and this is true today as well, we've seen it, right? And that's why my sense was that uh, the what the British government did in the 19th and early 20th century was to, they not to dismiss these fears outrightly so they they try to tell the public that look we're going to, to show the public we're going to take this seriously that's why we're going to conduct an investigation at the back of their minds they didn't believe this was a serious threat right but they didn't dismiss it outrightly because they were keen to build so trust in their is it the post office as well right and you can see that the postmaster general is saying that this is just sensationalism and uh, fear mongering right but nevertheless, they conducted this uh, test to prove that this is scientifically not possible, right? And presumably in this way, the public's trust in these in this institutions is going to you know, grow. And I think that's, it is because when I was looking, there are parallels that I found with um, telecom towers in contemporary India, right? A mm -hmm. lot of people are dismissing the, uh, the you know, anti-tower activists and they're dismissing uh, their arguments as irrational fears, you know? 
but uh, the first, the bottom line is that it's very difficult to actually ascertain to what extent uh, or how uh, electromagnetic fields impact health. Like, for example, if you want to know, are you going to develop cancer or not, it will take a long period of time to establish you know, <laughs> whether the tumor is caused only by the electromagnetic fields or and how you're going to separate between these sources, right, and what effect they have on health. But a lot of it was actually people being quite aware of uh, the state of science and manipulating it to make a point uh, uh, about being unhappy with the way in which the government has regulated telecom companies, right? And the way in which they have set up towers without you know, consulting local authorities and all mm -hmm. the corruption, that's right? So it's not that these diseases then become you know, a tool or an instrument for these groups of people to actually make a broader point about the fact that they are dissatisfied with the state or with, you know, telecom companies and yeah. so I, for me that aspect is always very important <laughs> and that's actually the interesting part about the whole story right um okay there uh, there are a few questions in the chat box uh amelia i'm just going to relay them so the first is from shova Broto. uh he's asked uh sure. he has a uh, general question uh, he said of course that it was an excellent presentation why do we know so little about the history and the growth of the telephone in South Asia, except Michael Mann and yourself, nobody has really written much uh, substantial on this particular technology. Your uh, thoughts, Amelia? That's a very good question. Uh, the only qualification, I don't know the answer. The only qualification I would like to make is that I actually haven't written about telephones in, uh, in uh, South Asia, only in uh, Victorian and Edward in Britain. Uh, Michael Mann has indeed published an article and that's pretty much the only thing I know about it, but I definitely encourage other people <laughs> to look into this topic because I think we will find very interesting things there. So please, by all means, do follow it up. <laughs> um, the uh, second, uh, there are two more questions uh, from uh, John Matthew. He also again thanks you for the lecture. His first question is, how might you speak uh, to some epidemics after the telephone and telegraph entered the equation that didn't get the attention of mass media, uh, for instance, the, the Spanish, uh, the great influenza in India, for instance. There, I mean, there are a number of views on this. Uh, David Arnold has spoken about this as well in this lecture series, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Amelia. Uh, so if I understand this question correctly, um, I mean, the, the telegraph definitely changed uh, uh, the way in which epidemics were reported in the sense that information could not travel much faster. Uh, but the one thing that happened is that especially, uh, and this is something that I wrote about uh, uh, in my first book, although not, uh, I didn't focus so much uh, on uh, medical news at the time. Again, a topic that someone should explore in more the, uh, depth. Um, the, for a long time in the 19th century, uh, telegraphic news actually uh, uh, coexisted with uh, the news sent by uh, overland mail. So mostly it's a uh, letters or correspondence reports. So you have these two uh, types of uh, reporting telegrams and overland mail, which then combined to create uh, you know, a, a broader picture of uh, what was going on, for example, during uh, epidemic outbreaks, right? And so you can clearly see during the 19th century that there is more and more reporting on epidemics, and then this is bound to facilitate the circulation of scientific information, uh, but also to um, spread uh, misinformation much faster. But uh, during epidemic outbreaks, I always want to point out rumors continued, even during this period, rumors continued to travel quite fast and also had, a, you know, so there were other ways of knowing about disease. Why? They didn't survive in, you know, uh, memory, public memory. I don't know. And in fact, uh, I haven't worked on this topic, but uh, we have submitted a grant on a similar topic, a misland topic that connected to this. And if that go, goes through, then we might be able to know about this uh, more in three, four years time. Yeah. Uh, and the follow-up question to that was, um, so speaking of these fears, right, uh, of around the telephone and tuberculosis, did this make, did these fears sort of make their way at all into the fine arts and the performing arts, like, you know, paintings, music, dance, op opera, even film? And did that have an effect, you know, on the public imagination um, as well? So I can't answer this question because I haven't looked at the fine and performing arts, uh, but 
this diseases of modern life project I've worked in in Oxford. Uh, some of us were historians, some of us uh, uh, were people specialized in uh, uh, um, English literature mostly. And so uh, they would be a much better place to answer this question, but th th you can have, uh, for example, literary representations of this disease. Uh, that's definitely, it was there. I don't know so much about the uh, fine and performing guns. I'm really sorry, I didn't look at this, right? I work mostly with uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, periodicals and the popular press. And this is actually one thing I always encourage uh, uh, people to do, historians more generally, to look at scientific periodicals from the 19th and early 20th century, because they don't just publish science. You're going to find a lot of information about other topics as well. Like I found about um, you know, technologies of communication. It's not really uh, a place where you expect to find information about telephones, but you will find a lot of interesting things. And I mean, curiously enough, the Diseases of Modern Life Project, uh, Professor S uh, Sh uh, Sally Shuttleworth, who is on it, is also part of a panel discussion um, next weekend because they were part of developing the Contagion Cabaret, which I think really looks at how some of these fears the uh, and the sort of public perception of uh, pandemics and various kinds of diseases came into performance art, literature, and so on. So yeah. that I think might be a great uh, point to uh, get in uh, to delve deeper into that question. Yeah. I think uh, I think we are coming to the end of our time now. And if there are no uh, further questions, I'd like to thank Amelia very, very much for this uh, really fascinating lecture. I think we all uh, found out something very new today. And uh, I'd also like to um, let ask the audience uh, to please fill out the feedback form and share your thoughts on and on the program. We'd also like to remind you that the recording of all our lectures will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So in case you missed any of our previous uh, events, do check out our YouTube channel. I'd also like to tell you about some connected programs that you could check out if you were interested by what Amelia spoke about today. We have a lecture by Professor David Arnold on science and seeing visual technology of contagion in the 19th century. Uh, there's also a couple of interesting experiments in our activity handbook, which look at contact tracing and the distance a sneeze can spread, which again are some of the things that might have come to your mind from Amelia's talk. But also, of course, if you want to know more more about the plague, do see Ranjit Kandal Gaunkar's exhibit on drawing the Bombay plague or explore controlling the plague in British India by Christos Linderis. Uh, all these will only be up on the Contagion website to the 31st of December. So do check them out. 